Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. God bless you, Pastor David. Train him coming into your heart, your life, your car, your home, wherever you're listening to this broadcast at, thanking you for tuning in. I'm going to be continuing in the series, Keys to Life, that I started. That's been probably about nine months ago now. And um, I'm going to be continuing that. However, as I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, I subtitled this, If You Love Me, You Will watch this, you will listen to this, you will read this, whatever form this finally takes. If you are, if your family loves you, these are messages from the heart that is going to ensure that they have an opportunity to know what it takes to gain access to heaven. In today's, if I had another title for it, it would be the garden and the cross. Today, we're going to talk about the garden and the cross. So let me get right into it today. Because of Satan's deception of Eve and Adam's disobedience to God's command, the entire earth was under the authority of Satan. My friend, this is where it all begins. Because Adam relinquished the authority that God gave him, and subsequently, Every other person that would be born after him would have that same bloodline. And instead of all of us walking in God's authority, many times without realizing it, we walk in false authority until we come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's because we needed to be restored, not because we initially did anything, but we needed to be restored because of what Adam did. And because of that, we had to come to God and submit to his will. And his will actually dictates that we pay for our sins. The Bible is clear. I may say it again. I think I will. You know, the wages of sin is death. And so sin is the door that leads to death. However, many do not associate sin with disobedience to God's command. You see, it's reduced to a series of actions that people have labeled, if you will, as being wrong. With most of those actions being sexual or uncontrolled drugs, alcohol, lying, cheating, stealing, the list goes on. You know what people say. However, these things are, are, are different actions that we must be aware of. And as believers in Christ, We've got to make certain that we flee those things just as Joseph did when he was being seduced by Potiphar's wife. We've got to flee all of those things. And so we must not look at the splinter in our brother's eye because they're doing something that we think is of great sin and we forget that we got a whole tree that's blinding us. We forget that in our judging and with uh, you know within our murmuring and within our complaining and all of these things, there are still evidence, there is still evidence of sin there. However, we talked about a moral compass in the pretty much the beginning of this series, I believe. And the thing is, if there is no moral compass, there would be no gauge that you will use to order your life after. And this is what makes the Bible so important. It becomes our moral compass. You see, sin is a nature that every person born in this earth has. Because of what? Because you're so bad? Because your parents were so bad? Remember what, uh, what Jesus was uh, confronted with? They said, you know, who sinned, this boy or his parents, that the boy should be in this condition? And Jesus said, neither one of them. Why? Because Jesus understood that sin was not based on a specific act. Hear it, that any other person did other than Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that initial sin was disobedience to God's law. 
The New Living Translation translates Romans chapter 8 this way. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. And that's why, verse 8 says, that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. I can go into this, I can talk about that, you know, but I, I think it would take up too much time. But notice what it says. The sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law. Now, why is that important? Because you're not the one that said, I'm going to just, you know, have this sinful nature. No, it was inherited. And it wasn't, it wasn't inherited from your mom or your dad. It was handed down from generation to generation to generation. And it was handed down from Adam in the Garden of Eden. And because we are all Adam's offspring, we were brought forth into this earth in iniquity. And the Bible says, and in sin, we were conceived. You see, the earthly heritage marks each of us for physical death. And in each of a and each of us are in need of a savior that's going to ensure that we do not experience eternal death. You see, that's what we do not want. You see, death has three components, as I began to talk about last week. Physical spiritual, and eternal. That spiritual part, you know, some people talk about that as being the soulish part as well. You see, each of these three components has its function, and God has provided a remedy for each one to live throughout eternity, which they will. It's just that not all of them in every single person born into the earth is going to live in eternity with God in the new heaven, in the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. You see, each of these have their function, and God has provide, provided that remedy. And so being aware of and understanding this allows you to address each of these components of your earthly makeup and bring the assurance of spending eternity with the Father in heaven into your life, your heart, and into your understanding. Now, as I said, we're created eternal. And what is to be determined is where you are going to spend that unending part of your existence. You see, eternal, or eternity, you know, or living in eternity or any other nuance that deals with eternity, you got to understand that simply refers to an unending part of your existence. And because we uh, we see and we're surrounded by death each and every day, it's hard for us to grasp the fact that that eternity is there. It's one step away. It's one word away. It's one sentence away as we receive Christ into our life. And so what must be determined is where you are going to spend that an unending part of your existence that we refer to as eternal. That's the choice that you must make before your physical existence is over on the earth. And the state you were forced into, it's because of your sinful nature in that state you were forced into, because of that sinful nature, you were forced into it because now we are following the father of the lie. We're following the father of the sin. However, despite that, God provided the opportunity for you to deal with that sinful nature and overcome the 
death that's associated with being estranged or separated from him. And this uh, can only happen because you were following in the footsteps of Adam without knowing it. And most of us didn't. I did a teaching probably, man, 25 plus years ago at the um, uh, Capital City Rescue Mission when it was over on Hudson Avenue. I remember that teaching to this day in the, the title that I gave that teaching in front of all of these people that were there was simply this, a victim of circumstance. And without knowing it, many of us are victims of circumstance, but because we know no other way we take and we allow those circumstances to become how we're going to live in this earth on a day-to-day -day basis. And since the Garden of Eden, the entire earth has been under this curse and not one person could escape it. Yet, Jesus Christ broke the curse over the earth when he came. Through his virgin birth, sinless life, inappropriate death, his burial, resurrection, ascension to the Father, and now with him being seated at the right hand of God the Father, forever living to make intercession for you. You see, Jesus took the authority back that Adam relinquished to Satan and he provided the opportunity for you to be restored to the Father. And for those who believe in Christ, those who submit their lives to the only wise God, those who submit their lives to the way, the truth, and the life, God has opened the only way back to himself through the blood that his son shed and the obedience of the people that are under him. I can go into a whole new teaching once again on this thing that we call obedience. Because, my friends, you can't live a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde life before God. You can't live one day all week long, and then on Sunday we come and get our praise on. I'm sorry. Many, and, and this breaks my heart, because many well-meaning Christians, they are teetering on the brink of hell because they do not see the danger in living with one foot in the world and the other foot in the kingdom. You see, even though Jesus brought us back to God, he broke the curse that Satan, you know, uh, brought into the earth through Adam's sin. You see, he provides the opportunity to be restored. And now we've got to come to a place where we're going to say God's way is the right way. And the Lord must show us how we are to live on a day-to-day -day basis. And the thing is, it's not easy to, you know, to just continue in sin without having guilt upon us. I'm not talking about it's not easy to sin. It's easy to sin. But my friend, when your mind is right and you come and you say, I'm serious with God, I'm going to do what God wants. It's just as easy to live right because God has made it so that we're sons and daughters. And I'm going to go back to that statement that I say so frequently, you know, it, just because God has made a way and he's looking past our faults and, and seeing, you know, the need that we have. It's not so much that he's looking past our sin and saying, it's okay, you can live any way you want. You know, you're still my child. It's not so much, and this is the part that I'm getting at, it's not so much that we are all sinners, in this earth. My friends, I've said it so many times, maybe it bears repeating. 
When he comes to that statement, when we hear time and time again, well-meaning Christians saying, we're all a bunch of sinners, what many times they're saying is, I'm giving myself a license to sin. They're saying that I have no control over my life and over my body, whereas the Bible says something different. Let me put it this way. You know what they're saying? They're saying that the God of this world has more power and authority than the God that created this world. See, we can't live that way any longer. We can't live saying, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. And I say it this way, then I'm going to move on. I always say it this way. I was a sinner. I was saved by grace. And now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Never forget that. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because that is the truth of your life. Doesn't mean that you're never going to sin. I also said it, I have also said this. Sinning might be something that I do, but sinning is not who I am. I'm not the sinner. Does that mean I'm never going to sin? It doesn't, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to purposely and consciously sin against my God. You see, our walk with God is not about a religious experience, but one that makes you a citizen of heaven while you live in this earth. And being a citizen of heaven, you've got to live just as if you are living in heaven while you live on this earth. Why? Because you are living in the spiritual uh, a kingdom of God. You see, some say that it's not necessary to go to heaven. They reason that God will provide only one way, you know, or I should say they reason why would God provide only one way when there's so many people in so many other religions in the world. They ask for proof that if they accept Christ, that they will be guaranteed eternal life when this life is over. And again, this ain't about religion. Because just as you need citizenship to enter a foreign country, having a passport from your country of origin, the same is true when it comes to the kingdom of God. <laughs> See, there, there has to be citizenship before you can get in. I'm hoping you hear that part. I think that that's simple. And so the world that we live in now, it's actually preparing you for the kingdom of your inheritance. And it is available for everyone. However, not everybody is going to accept it. Many times we have people who believe in heaven, but don't believe in hell. When the same book that talks about heaven reveals an eternal state also in hell. This book also reveals the steps that must be taken to access heaven and shun hell. It refers to the fact in John chapter 3 that you must be born again. And with Jesus Christ using the word must, he is saying that this is definitive. It reveals that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for your sins. You see, this book reveals that you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. My friend, as I prepare to end, know this that there are many other biblical New Testament references to the responsibility that God places on us. And the largest factor in this is one of love and of faith. However, please understand, many people that place their trust in God, their faith in God, say that they love God, they will never live the heights that God has for them because they do not read their Bible, hear this, with the intent of obeying what it says. That, my friend, 
is critical. You see, your parents, your grandparents, your other family members, your children, your grandchildren, all have either gone through the process or are going to have to go through the process before they leave this earth. And in answer to our prayers, like the Apostle Paul, you have been brought to this point where God is tugging on your heart. Because in Acts 16, 31, Paul told the Philippian jailer that if he would believe in the Lord Jesus, not only would he be saved, but his whole household. And my friend, it's not so much, I believe that God is saying, okay, because you as a born again believer are going to go to heaven. And so I'm just going to give everybody else a bypass of the process to getting into heaven. Hear it. God's not going to do that with our children. What he is going to do is he is going to make certain that his spirit doesn't give them any rest until they bow their knee before they leave this earth for good. <laughs> See, the desire of our parents, our siblings, our grandparents, and those who have gone before us, is that you would not miss the greatest opportunity that is afforded you, that is afforded, afforded humanity. And because this whole walk with Christ is a choice, it can be rejected just as easily as it can be embraced. And I go back to the statement I made saying that you need a moral compass. And the Bible is the moral compass that I believe in. And if I really believe in the Bible, and this is for you too, I must accept the things contained within its pages as truth for me. My friend, I'm not trying to convince anybody else in another religion of what I believe. When I first got saved, I tried to. I tried to get everybody to believe what I believe and see what I see. And I come to find out that if the spirit does not draw them, they ain't coming. And so in a morally declining society, as I stop here, people are data-driven. They rely on facts, but they have no ultimate standard for the way they are supposed to make decisions. Some people follow a church because of the data that that church has. They've got X amount of people. They got X amount of choir members. They got X amount of programs. They got X amount of pastors, not realizing that you can have all of those things and split hell wide open if Jesus Christ ain't in the midst. And so we've got to make certain that we tap in to the ultimate standard for the way that we're to make our daily decisions. So my friends, once again, we're stopping here. We're going to pick up next week. We're going to look at a topic that a lot of times we, we hear people mention, but we really, I think, don't have a biblical understanding of what it means. And that is we're going to just talk briefly about morality. Morality. Because, please hear, so many times we're hearing especially political groups, talk about the morals of the nation. My friend, if you don't have the Bible as your standard and living by that Bible, there is no morality. Because just because the Bible is a standard, if you're not living by it, what are you called? You're called a hypocrite. And Jesus referred to the scribes and the Pharisees as hypocrites. And in our generation, I think that, you know, those hypocrites are still there. I'm hoping I'm not one of them. I'm doing my best to live this Bible out. And when I talk to somebody or somebody talks to me and they see me and they see my actions, my hope is that they're seeing a person 
that is really in love with the Lord, our the Lord my God, and doing everything I can to live in a moral and ethical way. So until next week, my friend, Pastor David, thanking you again for tuning in, knowing that I love you, knowing that I'm praying for you. And I want you to know this, God's got all things under control. So with that said, God bless you.